All right, we are now recording. Yo, 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 yo. What's up, everybody? My name is Jawan Rohan. This is the Misguided Podcast. We intend to guide you to a better future. I'm sitting here with Don Don Zhu, uh, headhunter and entrepreneur. How are you doing this morning? Doing great, Jawan. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, it's it's you know what we've been uh, we had this plan for like a month and a half, maybe two months now, right? Yeah. So uh, it's good to finally get you up here. How is your morning going? Good, good. Just enjoying the New York change. The, we're about to hit the best time in the whole New York life cycle of the year. So excited <laughs> for the summer. You, so you like the summer better than the winter, even though like summer is like deathly hot. I like them both. I just love the four seasons. I'm an East Coaster my whole life. Yeah. Like I'm from China and even in China, we're from the Northeast. Yeah. <laughs> so it's the same weather patterns. I love the four seasons. I ski in the winter. I like go to the beach in the summer. So I like my four seasons. Okay. That's, that's what's up. Do you ski at all? Yeah. 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 yeah? I, ski, oh. I snowboard. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah, so you're, you're an adventurer. That's cool. Yes. What? So when you're from China, when did you move to New York? Oh, uh, well, yeah. I actually came to the U.S. when I was five. Okay. Like four or five. Um, grew up here and I kind of went back and forth a little bit, but most of my time was spent in Boston. Then I moved okay. to New York after college for uh, work. That's how I got into recruiting, you know, after college and uh, just been here ever since. Haven't left. Yeah. You, your Boston accent just came out when you said Boston. Oh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you could tell it switched right back to New York though. So that was, that was a quick one. Um, so do you have dual citizenship? Unfortunately, you're not allowed to you're not allowed to do that as a Chinese citizen. So I had to give up my Chinese citizen basically uh, during I made the choice in 2016, just a little nervous about the political situation, decided to get my U.S. citizenship th at that time. Yeah. So now I have only a U.S. citizenship. So is it because China makes that like a requirement like they don't want they don't want their people leaving the, the U.S.? Well, it's just certain countries only allow you to have one citizenship. Okay. So you kind of have to choose, um, mm. and that goes for China. Unfortunately, you can't have two. So yeah. either a Chinese citizen or a U.S. citizen. And because of you know how the political situation was back in the mid two thousand time frame, two thousand ten time frame, it was very imperative that I have access because I'm a real estate investor. I wasn't about to like let some judge or some rule exclude me from my investments yeah. here. You know, for sure. So for permanent sure. residents were being threatened at the time, and I felt very much. <gasps> forced to become a U.S. citizen at that point. Mm. Are you are you happy with your de decision now in 2023? Nope. I, <laughs> yeah. I wish I kept my Chinese citizenship. Yeah, Chinese yeah. Citizen. So, <laughs> That's know, why I asked. I was like, uh. <laughs> 2024 makes me very nervous. You know, I'm, I'm an immigrant and I'll always have an immigrant mentality and it's all about survival. So we'll see. Let's yeah. see what the next 20 years is going to look like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And no, I agree. Um, well, damn. Okay. I didn't know that, that they like, there's some country that, that make you uh, choose kind of one. That's, that's yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. um, okay, cool. So tell, you know, tell the audience exactly. Well, before we do that, I like to introduce how I found you. I always uh, introduce how I found the, the person on here. So um, I think I was just scrolling through TikTok one day and you popped up on my For You page. Um, and like I told you before the recording, I just really like the authenticity authenticity right like you were on there no makeup um you just straight told facts of like the hard it, oh i remember the video it was about the hardship of uh hardship of owning real estate and like how like literally like a water heater could just bust on you at any time and set you back like it was that video so i was like oh she's got to come up because that's actually literally what happened to me when i bought my first in investment property literally day of closing water heater breaks everywhere um the second day someone tries to break into my house so literally oh the door God. yeah it was crazy it was crazy so yep. that that video hit home to me right because yep. i was like well there goes like a couple thousand bucks um yep. that's why but that's why you have a uh the first the home warranty so that that thing yep. comes in clutch for sure but mm -hmm. um yeah so i that's how that's how i found you and then um you had a, you had a lot of followers on TikTok, so, so I was like, if I reach out via DM, she's probably not gonna see it. So I went to Instagram and reached out, and you saw it and responded right away. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for <laughs> <having> me. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Um, all right, let's go ahead and get into exactly kind of what you do, 
Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I run a recruitment business, DG Recruit. So I have my own recruitment practice since I've been recruiting after college. I did five years working for someone else. In that interim, I actually built up my real estate portfolio. So I kind of retired when I was 28. I just had enough real estate. I just didn't have to really work anymore. So I just quit my job, 28, no real game plan. Um, that was a very tough year. It was 2016. It was a very tough here to choose to become independent. And I had to go through a lot of like stuff that year, just with what with the political situation with being a woman that was kind of like in my late 20s and grappling with a lot of the stuff I saw in the real world and just a lot of PTSD, you could say, right, just from all the experiences I've had working in a very intense sales environment and performing at a very high level for many, many years. So when I was 28, I just kind of went full on into landlording, um, became a real estate investor for like two full years, really. And in that time, like part of the reason why I love your podcast is talking about the challenges, right? It's not always like, oh, you're going to go off with your million bucks and just like sail into the sunset. <laughs> like, there's a lot of rocky, rocky waves. And that's kind of what happened to me, just like lots of rockiness. And at that point, I decided to start my recruitment firm. So now I joke, my life is like R&R, &R, real estate and recruitment. So those are my two main fields. I like that, R&R. &R. Um, where'd you go to college and what'd you study? I studied finance and I went to college in a small business school in Massachusetts called Babson College. Oh, Babson. Yeah, I know. I know Babson. Yeah, that's a good school. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I went to Colorado College and, and we, oh. I, play, I played basketball and we ended up uh, playing in, at Babson College. Oh, that's so cool. So yeah. you've, you've been around, you know what it looks like. And all yeah, that. yeah, that was back in like 20, like 14, probably or okay. 13 or something like that. But yeah, um, that's awesome. That's awesome. Boston is cool. I, but the only thing I remember about Boston is there's literally a Dunkin Donuts on every corner. No oh. joke. Like every corner. Like, I don't know how that's possible. <laughs> yeah, Dunkin doesn't run America. It runs Boston. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Um, but uh no, that, that's really cool. So you studied finance um, and you kind of do something similar with that degree. That's really cool. I studied psychology and I do nothing with that degree. <laughs> and I studied Spanish and I forgot. So <laughs> um, that's cool to see. How'd you get into like the recruitment field? Right out well, of at the time I was 23 years old and I just wanted to find a way to make a living. Mm -hmm. And I, even though I studied finance, I was not really equipped to do finance yeah. Uh, I didn't like it. I didn't retain much from college. Honestly, can't tell you anything about anything <laughs> that's related to corporate finance. I don't know anything. I just kind of got by. Well, you, you know, supply and demand, though, right? <laughs> like, yeah. But yeah. I had like, a little in high school. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, so like college, I think I was so busy hustling in college just to like survive financially. I wasn't focused on school at all. Like yeah. academics was not even like, I hate studying, frankly. Like I'm just not wired to like, just be a student. So I actually enjoy making money. Making money is my passion. And so when I was quitting, uh, like graduating from college, I was really disillusioned with the types of jobs that I saw just through my internships. I was just like, this sucks. Like, I can't imagine people actually live this life where like they go to work, they make 60,000 a year and it's like shitty job. Like, yeah. I, just, I can't imagine that to be like life. Like life has just gotta be a little bit more than that, yeah. right? Like that is just so uninspiring. And I, so I already had that vision like in my internships being like, I definitely don't want a job. Like I was always like, happy when I didn't get any job offers. I was like, <laughs> this is perfect. I, I, I would have taken it just yeah, because yeah. it would have been something but I would have hated my job and I would have spent all my weekends figuring out how to get out of it. How did your parents feel about that? Um, well, my parents Mentality. really were busy with their own things. So my parents were like pursuing business ventures on their own. So they were just a little too busy to really worry about me. My mom wanted me to go to law school and she was trying to shove that down my throat. I rebelled pretty hard and was like, absolutely not. I'm not going to sign on to more student debt because at that point I already had some and I was like, I'm not going to get any more. Yeah. I just, I just don't see the value of spending $200,000 on a credit card um, that you're going to have to come out of the hole with, you know, going to your first job yeah. and you have to spend three years in school. And I was just like, I don't want to commit. Cause like, I think she thought that she was like, I'm going to pay for it. I was like, I don't trust you. 
<laughs> I don't believe that you're gonna pay for it. Yeah. Like, with what money? <laughs> like you're busy doing your own thing. Like yeah. with what money can you guarantee me that you're gonna pay for my law degree? And so I was like, I don't want to do any of that. I want to get straight to making money. And by chance, this recruiting firm from New York, I had, I guess, accidentally applied to a finance job. Because like, I didn't know what to do. I was just like, I don't, I'm just going to apply to random jobs. I just applied and the recruitment firm was like, there's no way you're going to get a job in a finance company. Like you just don't have the experience, but have you thought about becoming a headhunter? And because this is an obscure job, it's not a very popular career path. I've never heard of it before. So I was like, I don't even know what that is. And so they kind of explained it to me. It's a sales job. You start off at a very low base salary make $35,000. You come and live in New York. We train you up. And if you're any good, you'll average out at making about 60 grand a year. Like if you're any good, like that's an average salary, like in terms of commissions, if you're really, really good, you'll make more than 60,000. I was like, I can definitely survive in New York. If I get a 35 K base, I'm just going to live really cheaply. I'm going to share, get roommates, live far out, whatever, get situated and make that commission and just see where it goes. So it became a very like experimental experience that actually graduated into a very serious career that yeah. I took all the way to the top. Nice. Ex explain exactly what a headhunter does. So headhunters are salespeople that engage with businesses and they're usually niche. So my job was to work with pharmaceutical companies, prospect them, find out the correct person to prospect, sell to them the service of recruiting people for their niche skill set. So it's a, uh, we call it vertical market specialist, as in you recruit for the junior person up to the senior director of that vertical. So my vertical was regulatory writing. And my job was to work with these pharmaceutical companies, get them to like sign on to my services, convince them to use me. And then I would go out to the market, find them the candidate in that particular niche. And hopefully they would hire that person and if they did, I would get a pretty substantial fee for that. And it's who, who pays the fee? The recruitment, uh, the, the company, the pharmaceutical okay. company. So okay. the client pays the fee. The candidate gets the service for free. I'm again prospecting them. They're, so I have like two customers. Yeah, right? yeah. Like one is paying me. The other one kind of is paying me. Like through, it's like real estate, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Buyer's agent, seller's agent, similar concept. The seller pays the fee. The buyer yeah. gets the service. Same idea. So recruitment is very similar. And then every single placement I make, I then get the commission from that fee personally. And my company gets to keep the rest. So very similar to real estate uh, yeah. sales. Yeah. What uh, What was your your most you made doing that as a head hitter, like with that company? Yeah. yeah. So in my third year of recruiting, I was 25 going on 26. I made $215,000. This Just, was back in 2013. See, oh my God. So you was so, like balling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my first year, I made almost $90,000 in 2011. So even my first year, and yeah. this is me earning a lower commission. Mm. Like if I was supposed to earn good commission, I would have probably made about 120 to 150 my first year. Yeah. But because our firm kind of underpaid, I only got like about 90000 that first year. Second year, my income jumped up to 130 Third year, it went up to 215. Fourth year, I became a manager, hated that, made very little money because managers don't actually profit off of their team as much as they tell you. So I made really like not that great money yeah. in fourth year. And then my fifth year, I made another 200,000. And by that point, I had bought two homes and I dipped. That was when I quit my job at 28. Okay. Um, so just kind of like the, the, the process throughout that you're, you're you 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 know you you go in expected to make thirty five and you're like I can live off of that and then you end up making ninety so are you still living off of like thirty five and saving the rest are you still living frugal how's that yeah. Yeah? I was very very frugal my whole entire life even now I'm extremely frugal um, but back then I was even more extremely yeah, <laughs> with yeah. my frugality <laughs> and I looked at everything very strategically. Um, and even when I was making 215,000, I was living just like I was basically living year one. Yeah. So all my colleagues were like, why haven't you moved? Why didn't you do upgrade your car? Why didn't you, you know, I bought a Schnell purse, I bought a Rolex, you know, I bought nice things, but I didn't buy a lot. 
right? Yeah. Like my rent at that point was only four hundred dollars. So every single month, I was just socking that money away into investments. Yeah, and here yeah. And there, I'd just be like, "Oh, I'll buy a Rolex. Oh, I'll buy a Chanel purse." But like, I didn't overindulge. I didn't like upgrade yeah. my wardrobe. I did. That's what's up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was very careful to like only treat myself here and there. Even to this day, like if I travel, I'll always get very cheap plane tickets. I'll I'll For fly sure. Spirit. I love yeah. Fly Spirit. <laughs> Like, you know, I'm just very careful with like how I spend my money because yeah. it's so deeply ingrained in me on the come up of like how important it was to save money. Well, um, also, you could just lose that shit overnight. Like, oh, yeah. You, like, like, I saw yeah. that happen. Like, my colleagues would upgrade their lifestyle. Yeah. They have $4,000 rent. And I'm like, I cannot believe, you know, you're doing that. And, you know, they're still working for the man and I'm out here just, yeah, yeah. you know, chilling. So yeah. <laughs> that's just like, that's just how the game goes. If you're not careful with where you, you know, how you spend your money. And how yeah. What were you investing in early on? It was a lot of stocks in the beginning. I was just experimenting, kind of gambling. So um, I didn't do like index investing. I'm, again, I'm not of a strategic person. I'm more of just like take risk and action. So I just like ask like people I'm like what should i buy like what are yeah. you buying like what just, uh what what stocks were you buying i was buying like some pharmaceutical stocks i was buying some oil stocks because i like the dividends um i just kind of bought an array of different things yeah. and i basically put my money into stocks while i was waiting to mm -hmm. buy real estate and then when I was your when was your first purchase of yeah. real estate what year my first, my first purchase was i made i made the call to buy real estate in 2013 I put in the offer. It took a year for me to gain possession because it was a gut reno situation. Oh, okay. And I received um, ownership in 2014. So I got my first condo when I was uh, about 26 years old. It was a fix and flip? No, it was a gut reno that the company kind of renovated. They did it. Oh, okay. So when I bought it, it was fully renovated, brand new. Got really you. Nice, um, in a very uh, transitionary period of time in a particular neighborhood of Brooklyn. Okay. Um, and how many rentals do you have now? Now I have five homes and I'm in the process of building out a whole entire four family. Okay. Um, and like in terms of units, it's like a mix of single family and multifamily. Um, so I would just have to add it all up, but I'm in the process. Huh. Of selling I don't like, I don't like counting units. I like the actual, like the oh. transaction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I'm selling one of, I'm selling a two family right now. Okay. I, I'm like really slimming down my holdings at like my highest height. I had like 14 doors, probably like six different properties. I've been like slimming down my holdings over the years. I've bought and sold about 12 homes. Why, why are you slimming down? Because I just don't want to distract myself in terms of volume. I'm kind of moving into the different part of my life. I don't really want to have, I used to have homes all the way to Denver, to Massachusetts, to DC. And those were kind of like mistakes. <laughs> like I, I really want to focus on a specific geographic area. I'm doing a lot of Airbnbs now. So those require work and they yeah. require focus. Um, it kind of dilutes my time to split it across so many different locations so that was one of my mistakes i made was yeah. going too far out where even though i did make some good money it wasn't like that amazing and now i have to kind of like reshuffle my portfolio to was your was your furthest uh denver the furthest i went was denver yeah yeah you still have it or no Oh, I sold it a, a while ago. Oh, okay, okay, nice. Um, okay, so um, right now you got five, and are are all those five that you currently have still in Brooklyn or what? No, so they're mostly in um, like upstate and Vermont. So the property I'm offloading is in Baltimore. I did Baltimore. I bought like two homes there in 2016. I sold one a while ago. I'm selling the other one now. Hopefully, knock on wood, it'll close in a couple weeks. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the other homes are in Vermont and upstate New York. And that's where I want to kind of moving forward, focus my energy mm -hmm. on the Northeast. Yeah, no, that, that that makes sense. And yeah, it is like, you know, trying to run too many businesses, it, it stretches your time and, and your focus and, and okay. you grow slower. So that's cool that you're like really dialing in, you know mm -hmm. what you want, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's less of a risk in, in your in your head. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, what was your biggest mistake in real estate? 
I think my biggest mistake was expanding to geography oh, okay. that I wasn't yeah. very familiar with. Yeah. And the opportunity cost of those decisions are not great because yeah. my return was not phenomenal. Like I lost about $20,000 on my DC home, which doesn't really matter, but it's annoying. I could have used that money, let's say to buy crypto at the time, right? Like if I use that cash, I was, I, I started doing a lot of cash deals and cash deals are dangerous if you buy condos that are unwarrantable, like non-warrantable by lenders, right? So these are HOAs that are majority owned by like Joe Schmo person. Mm -hmm. They tend to be mismanaged. There tend to be some embezzling going on. There tends to be some bad stuff happening. Yeah. And so because my first two investments were condos, I got very arrogant thinking that I had the Midas touch. I was like, I'm the freaking condo genius. <laughs> I think I can just like turn out six figures every single condo I touch. Yeah, yeah. And theoretically, yes, I picked the right locations and I was there at the right time, but I bought the wrong home. I yeah. bought the wrong condo in the wrong condo association. So you actually lose a lot of money when you make bad decisions like that, because in real estate, as you know, it takes a while to exit the investment Yeah, you know, because you're, you're renting it, you're getting a couple tenants, you're figuring it out, you're getting to know the HOA and you're like, oh, this one sucks. Yes. Yeah. Like, what are you going to do? <laughs> Tell, right? Like, get yeah. the hell on out. Like, I'm not gonna How did you that. lose uh, 20K specifically? So, like, some of it was tenant damage. Okay. Some of it was unit damage from up above. Um, so, usually it's tied to the building being mismanaged. Mm -hmm. There's people that either don't have insurance on their units, so then you can't claim, you can't go after them. And then I tried to file a small claims and that didn't work. So it's, it's just like when you're dealing with multiple factors outside of your control, it doesn't matter how good of a job you do. If they keep leaking, you're going to keep suffering. Right? Did they have a water leak or something? There was a water leak and then they weren't going to pay me for it. And it was very nasty. And the person who owned it owned the majority of the condos in the area so you know you have this issue with like lawsuits with all this stuff so it just got to be i was like i got a dip I gotta yeah go. for right? sure so you always have to make that call same with the other condo complex there was like feces at one point in the common laundry room where like unfortunately people who were unhoused were you know camping out in the laundry room so again these are just run down condos that People shouldn't buy, but if you're out of state and you don't know any better and you see the price tag and you do the simple math of, oh, well, the rental is 10% or more, I'm going to get it. That's a good percentage return. If you're looking at it so simply, you might fall into the trap of buying a pretty bad investment. So yeah. That happened to me, you know, like with the condo in Denver, with the condo in D.C., um, somewhat with the condo in Massachusetts. Was Why condos? Like, I, I hate condos. I always yeah. I love single family or multifamily, but why condos for you? And for me, it was just because, again, back to my first two experiences were condos. Hmm. And the first condo I invested jumped by quite a bit. The yeah. second one I invested in was relatively also painless. Um, at that time, I also started buying multifamilies and singles. Okay. But I just felt like condos were cheaper, easier to buy all cash. Yeah. At that point, I was self-employed. And as a self-employed person, especially if you want to buy something during COVID, it has to be all cash because yeah. COVID rules really changed lending for self-employed people like myself. And so I wanted to get in on certain locations and I didn't have enough to do, you know, all cash homes, but I could do all cash condos. And I figured I knew enough and that the condo would just appreciate. And again, some of those bets were incorrect. Yeah. Uh, do you remember all right, your first deal? How much money did you put down on the deal? And how long did it take you to save? Uh, it was $90,000 to put down on the deal. I did 20% down. It was uh, 344K. And so I got a loan. You know, this was when I worked at the recruitment mm -hmm. firm. Um, it, I still I had about more than six figures saved at that point from a standing start of just three years. Mm -hmm. Within three years, I had already saved up over six figures because of both my cheap living and frugality, as well as my high earning from the yeah. recruitment job nice. um, and investing it into some stocks that more or less like gave me a little bit of return. <laughs> right? I wasn't yeah. like, I was not a great stock investor. Yeah, so yeah. It wasn't like I doubled my money. No, it was just like I mainly mo made it through recruiting and then didn't spend it and then just saved it yeah. through stocks.
No, that makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, do, do you always put down 20% now or have you kind of changed your strategy? Well, I do a lot of cash deals. So I okay. still, you know, if, when I see good cash deals, I'll do all cash. Um, or like I haven't done a loan in a while. Yeah. Um, so most of my deals recently have been all cash. That's that's awesome. Good. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, that's I, I, yeah, that, that's very rare. And it gives you a high like um, a high acceptance rate. Right. Getting your offers accepted. Um, I love when when clients come to me with with cash. Uh, I'm a realtor in California. So, um, OK, cool. And then are you still invested in stocks at all? Yeah. 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 So recently I started I stopped investing in stocks for a while in 2016 because I thought the world was going to end. Mm -hmm. I like had all these psychological like, yeah, yeah. issues when I became an entrepreneur. Because yeah. I think leaving the comfort of being a worker at that age um, without any guidance, without any support, without any network of like people in a similar situation. I was so nervous in 2016 with the election. Yeah. I actually sold all my stocks and lost a shit ton of money doing that. I probably would have like made a lot of a money. Lot of money. <laughs> I would have made a lot of money. I took yeah. the advice of a, of a date that I went on and oh. the guy graduated from Harvard and I thought he knew something. I didn't. Yeah. And no, he was so wrong. And so I made the mistake of taking on bad advice. Uh, didn't, you know, hedge my bets. I sold the whole portfolio. Anyways, so I got into crypto investing, which like did pretty good. Yeah. Um, and then really starting earlier this year slash late last year, I was like, okay, I got to really build up my stock portfolio. So now I'm starting to like buy more stocks so far. So decent. But again, my main game is uh, real estate. Like yeah. you know, as much as I'm like, oh, it would be great to just have a lot of stocks. I'm still debating, you know, how, how to, how to split it. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause I'm so comfortable with real estate, which is yeah, so yeah. comfortable. I've made the most with real estate, even crypto. I like more than stocks. Cause I'm like, I just see some future there. Um, yeah. I'm more comfortable doing that. So I'm still figuring out my stock strategy. Um, but in the meantime, I did buy some. That's what's um, up. What's your what's your favorite stock right now that you kind of um, invested in? I don't have that many different stocks. I have like Tesla, Amazon, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, and you don't have uh, Apple. No, I, I don't think so. No, Apple's much. like the it's the best stock. It's, it literally yeah. it doesn't lose. Like it's just ridiculous. It doesn't lose. I used to have it when I in twenty. When yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I it then. So I haven't re got into it. Um, yeah. Like I said, I'm, I'm waiting. My next big project is really building that for family that I'm still in the process of like getting like the approvals. So that that's like my next big, that's big your, challenge. Yeah. That's your baby right there. Yep. That's <laughs> what I need. I need to cash out all my stocks for that. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, that's just a, you know, midterm holding strategy, but I'm going to yeah. like kind of cash out and like put it all into this home. For sure. so we'll, we'll see how that goes. That's still yeah. in the mix. That's what's up. I want to jump to the hella misguided segment where I ask the same question to each entrepreneur that comes up here. That question is simple. Uh, if you were to write a letter to your 18 year old self, what would a summary of that letter be? So who I was at 18 is extremely different than who I was at 23. I think if I were to go back to myself at 18, it would be to um, get an advance on my like, self-education outside of college, right? So I think at age 18, if you if you haven't already gone to college, like, first of all, knowing what I know today, it's like, you might not even need to go to college, mm -hmm. like knowing who you are. Um, but unfortunately, I think a lot of people can't take that risk if they don't have the family guidance to yeah. take that risk. Yeah. Like for me not to go to college would have been an utter impossibility just with the type of parents I had, yeah. like being Asian, being first gen, it would have been an utter impossibility. Mm -hmm. Did I have to go to college? I absolutely did not have to go to college because I'm not a worker. I'm not a traditional office worker. And I never really became one. Yeah. Right? Like I did it in my internships, but I think you just don't know what you don't know when you don't have parents who are exposed in corporate America. Yeah. You don't, you don't have that guidance. Like I have that guidance. Now my kids are going to be very, very privileged. I'm going to let them know, look, if you don't plan to be an office worker, if you're not trying to work at JP Morgan, you don't really need a college degree. You yeah. can just do what mommy does and go and sell shit. 
Like, you can sell shit today. You yeah. can start selling shit when you're 14. Yeah. Like, you don't need to wait. You Like, there's, like, two paths in life, right? One is the more cookie-cutter, traditional path. And that was not right for me, right? Yeah. Like, my path was always going to be sales, was always going to be making money, entrepreneurship. It was never going to be go and get a job at Joe Schmo Bank as a data analyst. Yeah. Right? So I think if I were to go back to 18... It would have been like, really screw your parents. Like, screw everything they taught you. They don't know anything about how this country goes. Yeah. Like, you need to have a lot more confidence. But at age 18, I don't think I have that knowledge. Um, and I would have been utterly scared to even comprehend For sure. such advice. For sure. No, that that is, that is a well said. Well said, for sure. I think that there is a huge misconception of we need to go to college in order to get jobs. Um, I think that that will eventually be dead in the water fairly soon. I, I feel like if it's not already, I mean, I, I feel like a lot less people are going to college or at least going and dropping out first year um, mm -hmm. and realizing like, oh, I just need to sell shit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. um, like that There's is certain people. Right? Yeah, certain yeah. People, certain people need college. Yeah, for certain sure. People need it because they're going to go in very traditional paths. Mm -hmm. But if you know you're not going to be like a traditional person, and that's just not what you want, then you kind of have to take chances when you're younger. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Like entrepreneurship, business. Uh, being a business owner is not for everyone it, you know obviously doctors and and stuff like that have to go to college like i don't want no no doctor <laughs> working on me who who didn't go to college right um yeah. but i want yeah. you to go to college for a long time yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I, decade, please. <laughs> I want you to still be in college <laughs> online classes yeah, if you're too young i'm like mm, older one <laughs> yeah yeah that's funny um no, that's cool. That's cool. Okay, so let's talk about kind of your shift from long term renting to Airbnb. Now you're you're trying to do Airbnb. Uh, how long? When did you first open your your first Airbnb? Yeah, so 2018 was when I started like doing Airbnbs. Okay, and that was out of a survival desperate situation because at that point it was a four family that I had in Vermont, and the long term tenants that I had, it was like a mess. It was actually really scary. Because people in Vermont have guns and I don't have a gun. And my tenants would like threaten me. And I'm like, this, this is like. Threaten no you to, with, and say what? Um, so I had a lady who was cuckoo, like legit cuckoo. And did you do, quick question. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be rude, but did yeah. you back background check them and all that stuff? Really. No, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, like at the time again, it was just like oh, that's I'm a just... mistake. That's a mistake right there. That's a mistake. Oh my gosh, yeah. I was so <laughs> desperate for tenants that yeah, like yeah. and she was very nice mm. and charming. So a big clue of like sometimes bad tenants, they're very charming. They have excuses, they have a sob story. And I was just very young and I wanted the money and they had the money, and I was like, let's go. How yeah. bad could this be? And it got pretty bad. Uh, she threatened me like through text message. One time I showed up with my dog. Thank God I have a giant Doberman. And she was like, oh, I didn't know you were here. I thought you were an intruder. I would have shot you. And I was like, well, I'm going to screenshot this. and I'm going to send it to the cops. Like this, this is like threatening. This is not you. You meant that in a yeah. way, that, you know what my dog looks like. You know what that bark sounds like. I'm not some, there's not a lot of Asian ladies coming around Vermont like hanging out yeah. in the same car as your landlord. Like, you know, yeah. it, you know, it's just like, I knew she was threatening me. Um, and in those cases, again, you need to go through the proper channels. You hire a lawyer, you get them out. So after a couple of those experiences, I was just like, I'm so scared. I genuinely can't imagine having another long-term tenant because unfortunately in the areas that I was investing in, the tenant population isn't working at fancy six-figure jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, there was some very bad issues with drug abuse in certain parts of America. And those are the parts of America that are affordable for young you know, real estate investors to buy property. And so, yeah, yeah. you know, you get a certain like demographic of customer that you bite off more than you can chew. And yeah. the government, unfortunately is offloading the responsibility of taking care of its citizens to private people like landlords, right? So unfortunately I had to just make the call that I can't do this. 
Yeah. Like, I'm literally not equipped to deal with these type of people and what issues they may bring to me, literally putting my life in danger. No. So I was just like, for fun, I had a fully furnished unit that I personally went to, to ski um, in that unit. So I was like, I'm just going to put that on Airbnb. So I did. And all of a sudden I got a lot of customers and I was like, this is great. So I just started like renovating each of those units and providing Airbnbs. And nice. without Airbnb, I would have, I don't even know what would have happened for me. You would have like, lost money because you would have had to sell probably. It would have been really bad because yeah. I, at that time I had another long-term tenant in that four family unit who I inherited. And this was an older person. And unfortunately this person had clogged the downstairs unit and the whole downstairs unit was utterly decimated by sewage sewage water um and so we had to fully renovate it it was like about sixty thousand cash i wasn't going to get a heloc your home you're personally you're self-employed like it's it's a hassle to get loans yeah, you're yeah. Self and yeah. i didn't want to get a heloc so i was like thank god with this airbnb i got the money to then pay for the construction reconstruction because unfortunately long-term tenants they don't have any money for you to go after yeah. so it's not like you can say here's a sixty thousand dollar bill thank you very much you, that doesn't happen. So yeah. you're responsible. And so Airbnb became my salvation and became like a very much necessity to survive. Yeah. Yeah. That's 60,000. I would be so mad. Did, did you, uh, Hey, I mean, would you, did he stay after that, after it was fixed? Yeah. Because again, I'm a nice person and mm -hmm. because the person's very old and um, she was, you know, living by herself. What are you going to do? Right. Uh, it was just like, when she was paying every time. It's just like she just clogged the toilet or the the, the government pays. So oh. this was not a personal this gotcha. person had no money. Gotcha. So again, when you're investing in these areas, the people don't have a lot of yeah. Money. Yeah. That is why they can't buy these homes. Were you doing section eight? Was that your what? first time? What was it? Wasn't, it? it wasn't section, it wasn't like section eight. I guess it's just another type of government subsidy, right? Oh, okay. It's just, the government just every state has like different things yeah yeah, yeah. um and like there's short term there's like long term state vouchers everyone i guess calls yeah it yeah differently. um so i guess you could call it section 8 but it wasn't technically section 8 no that's what's up okay cool um yeah dang that is that is like poop like someone pooping in your closet is ridiculous and then you br bring down this uh this sewer problem like oh my god that I, my my heart can't take it. My anxiety is so bad with stuff like that. Like like I told you, uh, when I when I bought <clears throat> in 2021, I bought an investment property in Stockton, California, and um, it, like first day the water heater breaks on closing day, which is like two days before Christmas. So oh. that was our that was our Christmas present. Oh. Uh, yeah. yeah, and then um, then like the day after someone tries to break into the front door, thankfully they couldn't get in because it's an old school door. You know, it's the real yeah, hardwood. So I was like, oh my God, I'm never getting rid of this door. Like, thank you. Cause I had, we had just put, we were setting it up for Airbnb. So we had TVs yeah. in the closet, everything. Right. Yeah. And yeah. uh, I was just so thankful. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, you know, buying real estate is you gotta have reserves, right? You gotta have, like a plan A, plan B, plan C, all the way to plan Z, really, because yeah. yeah. um, you just never know. And there's a lot mm -hmm. of mistakes that will be made, even if you try to avoid them. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. yeah. You so, could also do everything the right way. And yeah, they could still be bad. Like a tenant could be good for a whole year and then all of a sudden stop paying rent. Like yeah. anything can happen because you're dealing with real humans and they're behavior and then you have the government that is against you so in most governments they're they're not helping landlords they're very much out to get you which is unfortunate but that's just you don't get any support yeah you know and so you have to have money money yeah. is your only salvation. that's why that's why a lot of uh like beginning investors stay away from california um just mm -hmm. because the the tenant laws here are they're they're for the tenants <laughs> um yeah. but, uh no that that makes sense um okay let's uh let's talk what, what do you what do you like better renting or owning i think i saw a video of you saying that you you rent your current place but you have you know re rentals across the country or you did so why why is that oh um, well i live in new york city right now and we found a really good deal so i've always had really good deals rental yeah. deals 
Um, if you find a small landlord, I'm Chinese. I used to live in Chinatown in Brooklyn. My landlord and I are like friends. I was his tenant for 10 years, you know? So I was paying like a couple hundred dollars because I owned the lease and I subletted all the rooms. So I'm what's called a rent hacker, right? So for me to buy a house would insanely increase my cost of living. Yeah. Like I'm paying a couple hundred a month. Right, like it's really cheap. So, what, what do you mean you're a, you're you're rent hacking essentially? So, yeah. what? Yeah, yeah. To break that, how the lease worked. So, I just own the lease. Like that's my unit. I own a three bedroom, two bed lease. That's my lease with the landlord. Yeah, now, and, and you're renting right. out the rooms or something. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I rent it out to my friends, to people on Craigslist. I've probably had like thirty roommates over the last 10 years or more, maybe 40 roommates. I, I've lost, I don't even count. So do you have a roommate right now? Oh, no, no, no. So my lifestyle changed oh, okay. when I met my partner. Okay. Right? Before that, I was just, my mentality was I'm never going to rent yeah. a place by myself. Like, why would I do that? Like, I'm only coming here to sleep. I travel a lot. I like go to all sorts of places. I got lots of projects that I'm working on. I don't need a luxury one bedroom to myself. Yeah. That's always been my approach. So up till I was about 32, I always had roommates from 20, like from like 20 to 32. I started out like back in the day, renting out my entire family home in Boston. Like I was renting out every single room to like students. Right. So I did the same thing when I came to New York. Yeah. I like I'm going to take over this lease. My roommate was leaving. He, I paid him for the lease he introduced me to the the landlord. I took over the lease and I just started renting out the rooms at whatever market price that I felt was fair. Yeah. And I would just select the candidates. Obviously I'm a recruiter. So I would just interview people and be yeah. like, oh, you're cool. You can live yeah. with me. <laughs> Thankfully 10 years, no real issues. Cause if they live in my house, I get to call the shots. If you're being weird, you gotta go, right? Yeah. Like, I don't want you here. Did and you have them sign anything? Sometimes we'd have like a sublet agreement, um, you know, like monthly sublet. Here's the deposit you gave me. But again, because I was living there, I really picked my roommates very carefully. Mm -hmm. So it'd be like a student or like- Were they, were they always girls or did you pick guys mostly too? Mostly girls, but definitely I had some guy friends as well. Okay. So I had a mix. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. Like all different races, all different genders. <laughs> like, I was just like, hey, as long as you're cool and you're not freaking- you know, do anything weird. Yeah. Like you can be my roommate, like yeah, we'll yeah. be friends. And so I, I rent hacked for a very long time. And then when I met my hubby, we, I got another rental. Like I just keep getting rentals because yeah, it's yeah. so easy to get rentals. Like if yeah. you have a good side of score, you, you've got the money to put it down. Like, <clears throat> all day long. Well, also, also though, like what, so here's the thing too, with rentals is they require like three times the, the rent, right? Like, that's yeah. kind of, that's kind of, I feel like that's kind of hard to qualify for most people, right? right. right. Um, like most people can't do that. So yeah. um, like that, when, when you compare renting versus owning, right? It's like, okay, well, I have to go get a down payment. And I still have to qualify. I have to have a good credit. Well, so you have to have a good credit for renting too. I'm not going to, you know, give you a lease if you have a 560 credit score, right? Mm -hmm. Um so that's a that's a huge thing I see that like people um, not argue about but uh, c communicate about. Um, yeah. But yeah. So uh, how long have you been in the current space that you're in right now? Uh, since 2021 in February, we mm. moved to a new place and okay. we pay really cheap rent. It's rent stabilized. So you know, there's that in these big cities as well. So you can get very nice rental deals. Like if you're qualified and you got the money ready to go and everything's fine, it's really easy to get rentals. Yeah. So again, like to buy a home, like take my first condo that I bought in Brooklyn. It was in an area that was not really great. I would not want to live there. Um, but unfortunately, you would have to have $90,000 versus this house. I live in the nicest neighborhood. I put down one month's rent, you know? So it's like, yeah. what's more expensive? How much Buy is it. your rent? How much is your rent? It's like twenty three hundred now. For when what? I first moved in, it was nineteen fifty. Mm. For okay. what? What uh, is like three bedroom? Two. No, two no, bedroom. no. Just one bedroom, pretty big, you know, luxury building, um, in a very nice, safe, wonderful part of. You're gonna have to get a two bedroom soon, huh? Soon, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. That's why I'm building the four family house in mm. Vermont. 
you know, that's going to be my primary. We want to build it and have all these different units. So that's the project. I'm so are you going to, you're going to end up moving to, to Vermont and kind of like settling there as your, your home? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's the goal because, you know, I have, we were kind of consolidating all of our holdings in Vermont, Vermont and upstate New York. So yeah. Upstate New York's like two hours from Vermont. So we want to really like build that house, you know, get there. My parents can live there. My in-laws can live there. Why Vermont? Like, there's nothing there. Why do you like Vermont? <laughs> there's sea mountains. There's, oh, yes. Sir. It's a sure. very good place for sea mountains. And in the time that I invested there, the homes were, like I said, really, really cheap. Yeah. Like, people were not able to buy homes there because that area was very economically depressed. Yeah. So a lot of people like us from out of state, you know, it's kind of crazy. Most people who own there are, like, out of state. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's just a really good place financially. And then the Airbnb and then the rentals, there's there's a lot of favorable conditions for real estate investors in it, houses like that. Is Airbnb cash flow good there in Vermont because of ski season? Or is it like, how's the summer? Like, are people, is it consistently busy? Um, winters are where you're going to get the most action. But uh -huh. summertime, you can also do decent. Like you can is do- Is there like a lake or something over there? Tons of lakes, oh, okay. tons of hiking, um, nice. tons of beautiful scenery, and then also family, mm -hmm. right? Like people actually have family there and they need places to stay. Yeah. And then also travel nurses. So that's another big market travel. for Airbnb investors mm -hmm. is providing housing for out-of-state workers. They're the um, best. They're the best guests mm -hmm. ever. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. they're still messy and smoke. Like, I don't know. I've hosted one pair and I was like, oh. like uh, I was not impressed. I was like, uh, the, the rates were decent. Again, anyone who's living there a little longer than a weekend, they'll cause damage. Yeah, they'll yeah. cause damage because they're using the unit every single day. Yeah. They're taking showers. They're not turning on the vents. Like the longer someone lives in your home, the more damage they cause. It's yeah. just kind of what happens when you use an item, right? Yeah. So it's it always comes with strings attached, which is why Airbnb the margins are much higher. But people forget the labor is much higher to operate an Airbnb. Oh, for sure. For sure. For because sure. you got to fix it every time. You got to clean everything. You know, there's a lot of labor. So I don't know. It's it's just a journey that I'm, I'm on. I re The, the um, gains are really significant, but you end up spending the gains on your home. You yeah. end up fixing the roof. You end up building a new porch. Like homes cost a lot of money to like really get up to running. Let's talk about what, what was your biggest Airbnb mistake when you first got into Airbnb? Um, thankfully, knock on wood, I didn't really make any mistakes. Uh, it really was, it wasn't really much mistakes. It's just, um, you learn the small things as in like, if someone doesn't have any reviews, mm -hmm. you need to charge them a deposit. Right. Mm -hmm. Like you definitely need cameras. So mm -hmm. if something goes wrong, you have evidence. So the weirdest thing happened when I first started Airbnb, it was like two different parties. Cause remember it's a four family. So I rented two units out. One party ended up throwing a mysterious white powdery substance on another party's car. It's like, why would they do that? Wow, I don't yeah. know. And I didn't have cameras at the time. So I couldn't pinpoint what happened and yeah. odd things happen right like, so like party one throws powdery substance on party two party two funny enough they're chinese so am i they're <laughs> like they're very innocent right they're like this is cocaine and i was like uh i don't think normal people would waste a whole bag a whole yeah yeah honda like it's unlikely was right? it actually cocaine no, it was probably oh. laundry detergent, which is still weird. Like, That's so weird. Who does that? So yeah. I had to, I had to troubleshoot as a customer service app yeah, yeah. and say, "Hey, man, I'll pay for you to get your car washed, right? Like, please don't leave me a crappy review. I'll give you just show me a receipt, how much it costs to get your car washed. Problem solved, right? Yeah. So thankfully, the the Chinese family. One had a BMW, one had a Honda. The Honda was the one that was dumped on. I was like, phew, thanks for that. Yeah, like, right. At least it wasn't the luxury white BMW. <laughs> that up. Like, you know, at least, you know, so it's, you never know what's going to happen. And I'm sure if you ask a lot of Airbnb operators, the craziest stuff happens. Fights, drunks, neighbors getting involved, like what have you. Like, so yeah. everything comes with a humongous, like, 
personal stress in real estate. Yeah. I get so much anxiety when uh, someone who has no reviews checks into my place or yeah. the, the most sketchiest is when they create the account the same month, like oh, right yeah. before. And I'm like, oh my God. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I mean? I Like when someone comes in and they got 14 five-star reviews, I'm like, just do whatever you want. Like, yeah. <laughs> like do you, you ain't even got to tell me. Like, <laughs> yeah. like great. We're yeah. Yeah. Great. But yeah, yeah, so yeah. That's why you start learning. Okay. I got to start charging people a deposit if they don't have any reviews. Yeah. You know? And even if they have reviews, they could damage your, your, your furniture. Mm -hmm. uh, but Airbnb makes it really easy to file a claim and get the furniture, you know, replaced. So yeah, it's, it's, it, that's why I'm like Airbnbs, it's relatively controlled environment where you, you have a lot of ways to work through it. And because I put in this um, deposit thing, like if you live in my house for more than seven days, you have to put down a thousand dollar deposit prior to you coming into the home. That's just a personal rule I have. And it gives me peace because, you know, it just means that you got the thousand dollars to spend. That's really yeah. what I'm testing. I'm testing like, do you got a thousand dollars like on a dime to like throw at me? Because if you have a thousand bucks lying around, it means you're at a different economic situation where someone's like, I don't have a thousand dollars. Well, I don't want you to live in my house then. Like, yeah. what do I, you know, like that puts me in a very high level of risk. Yeah. Well, if it's like someone's like, sure, here's a thousand dollars. I'm like, great. You don't even have to have reviews. Do you do night rentals? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like uh, daily, you know, okay. it's daily do rentals, but people will request for like two months. No. Yeah. Yeah. I'm saying, but yeah. if, if they request for like a weekend, are you getting a deposit or something? No, no, no. Again, depending on what the situation is, if they have no reviews less than seven days, I charge a 250 deposit hmm. cheaper. Right. Yeah, yeah. But if they're going to stay for more than seven days, even if you have reviews, I want a thousand dollars. Do you allow monthly rentals because it creates a uh, tenancy? Yeah. Monthly rentals, especially in the summer, is phenomenal. In the winter, you can charge more. But I've hosted monthly winter rentals before. And the level of labor that I had to go and clean, yeah. I mean, it was gross. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. Really gross. I don't, I don't allow the, uh, more than thirty day stays, um, especially yeah. in California because it creates like tenancy, and then, then right. uh, it, get, trying to trying to get them out would just be a nightmare. Yeah. So twenty yeah. days max in California. I'm open to it in my in my other states. Like I have some in uh, in uh, Austin. I'm actually going down Monday to set up another one, but. Um, mm -hmm. I would be open to it there, but I still, yeah. I don't really like it. I don't like 30 yeah. days stuff. It makes yeah. you nervous. Cause you're like, am I going to get a squatter? Like, yeah. you know, it's, it's so nerve wracking. And yeah. this is what I mean. The government is not supporting small business because they're not looking at us like small business. They're mm -hmm. looking at us like this landlord. It's like, no, no, no. It's a small business. We need yeah. protection. Yeah. We need help. Um, so it's concerning, but you're absolutely right. It's like state by state. You have a law that creates that tendency if they live 31 days, you're screwed as a landlord. Yeah, you for sure. You evict them. So thankfully in Vermont, we don't have that issue. You know, it doesn't create tenancy. Yep. Cool, cool. Well, uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know you probably got a busy day. So the way I like to uh, wrap up the episode is with a segment called Guided Conclusions. Um, and that, that question can be anything um, that we did not talk about prior to recording. Uh, are you ready? Yeah. All right, cool. Um, what's your favorite? No, I'm, I'm going to switch it up. I'm going to do a better one because you mentioned this uh, in, in the beginning of the episode, um, but you said that you're kind of scared for 2024. So I want to know, what do you see the future looking like and what scares you most? The future, the, the part that scares me the most is the dollar depreciating. That is mm -hmm. my biggest fear is if the U.S. dollar loses its world reserve currency status. Um, now, that's that's like a doomsday kind of mentality. Yeah. And so how I how I guide, guide against that is that I try to like be more rational around like the facts. Right. Like I do believe with a decent amount of conviction that in my lifetime, I'm 35 now. In my lifetime, the U.S. country is going to lose its status as, a, as the number one superpower. I'm pretty like sure of that happening. Um, you think so China will take over? 100%. China is going to be much more successful for a number of reasons. Um, and I just see it as a matter of time 
before the power axis shifts. Mm -hmm. This is inevitable. In mm -hmm. history, this happens and this is the time. Like I'm going to see it in my lifetime before I die. So what I'm trying to do is in the short term, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in the next 10 years. It might take a generation. So I got plenty of time. I got plenty of time to like get my money, get everything sorted out, get my cash liquid so that I can eventually probably like as things progress, I'll have more control over what I should do next. You're but, like, uh, China, can I get my citizenship back? <laughs> Please. I, I'm more looking at Singapore. You know, I think uh, a, lot of, a lot of countries are looking for <clears throat> successful, wealthy people from other countries to immigrate, to get them to immigrate. Yeah. Right. So uh, my view is like, that's what I'm interested. I'm interested in making myself a very desirable immigrant. And <laughs> I want other countries to take interest in me and my family. Yeah, yeah. Just show up with our little bag. <laughs> and be ready to, to get, you know, so that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking, which is very much doomsday. You yeah. know, I'm hoping that it never happens, but I have a feeling it will happen. And you just have to be prepared not to have the rug ripped from under you. Yeah. Um, and, and even so, if you choose to stay in America, how are you going to play the game? Yeah. Are you going to do like, am I going to send my kid to a school down the street? Probably not. I'm probably going to homeschool them. Yeah. You know, like it's just like doing the game differently because I just don't want the same. I don't like what I'm seeing. I don't like the stuff I'm seeing. I don't like a lot of the issues that are happening. Um, and I want to make sure my, my children are going to be prepared in the future. I don't know what that's going to look like and we'll see how that goes, but it's just like, don't get too comfortable with the status quo, because yeah. in today's age, things change at an astronomically fast pace. Like if the dollar loses value, you saw that happen. The speed of information is at such a high pace that it won't take like if shit unravels, it won't be like 20, 40 years. Yeah. It will be like five years. Like yeah. the, the timelines are shrinking because information is traveling at a faster pace. And when there's massive panic and people are just like leaving, you can't contain that. Like yeah. people are going to get out, right? Yeah. Like what happened to Nazi Germany? Like here, first of all, it's possible. And secondly, you're not going to have like, people aren't going to be questioning should they leave Nazi Germany. Germany. They're going to be leaving right away. Yeah, like yeah. the fast pace of information transfer isn't what it was before. And yeah. the price that people have <laughs> location is not as serious like if you look at patriotism people are being survivalists right now if i need to move to a different country to have a better life i'll do it yeah no I mean, my, my wife is literally every day sends me tiktoks <clears throat> saying why we should move to portugal oh she, great she wants, she wants great. i'm like i i am not financially ready to move to portugal and my business like i have no i would have no business over there yeah. <laughs> so i'm yeah. like but i i will entertain it though like yeah. so once we save up some stuff yeah. you know what i mean so um if, if the government changes their approach to like business and how they yeah. work with small business people like you and me yeah if, if we see that the government is making our lives better and that our dollar our tax dollars are actually going towards value yeah. then we'll stay because yeah. you, you're going to do whatever is best for you. And right now, it makes sense to stay here and invest mm. here for the next decade or two. Yeah. But should things start changing in the next seven, the next election cycle, should 2016 repeat itself? I don't know how much of that I want to take. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't know how that's going to help me if all of a sudden, you know, all these social ills are yeah. threatening my daily existence. Yeah. So, I don't even, I'm so done with presidents now. Like, I don't even want to pick anymore. I just like, yeah. you know what I mean? I'm like, we need a new structure or something. But what, okay, one more question. Uh, I know that was supposed to be the last one. What, where do you see kind of real estate going in the next three years? I think real estate is a really challenging asset class, right? Because it's so illiquid. Mm -hmm. Like, you are really stuck with it. And again, as a landlord, I think we face a lot of challenges where everything's so public now that if your tenants wanted to sue you because they know you got multiple properties, you increase your risk by such a high degree. <clears throat> so I think real estate, for me personally, it's not going to be a long-term 
Like that's, I'm probably going to cycle out of real estate in the next probably decade other than like really limited. That's why I'm like downsizing my holdings. Mm -hmm. Like I don't, I don't want based on the current economic situation and the government and the way policy is going, I don't want to be running 30 units. I don't want that. Yeah. I actually don't see the value in that. I see that as being a hindrance. I see as that being a humongous risk for my money. Yeah. Like now I'm moving towards, well, shit, if I got a million dollars and I get a 10% return without doing jack shit, if I just put this 10, this million dollars in a dividend producing stock, I don't have to do jack shit and I make 50 grand a year. Yeah. yeah. Why is that better than owning real estate? It, like it's uh, sorry. Why is real estate better, better than, than that? Yeah, yeah. Like real estate is so much work. Again, if the government doesn't change how they're going to treat us, I'm out. I'm going to do what's easy for me. Right. Yeah. Like I don't have to hustle anymore. I, I already did that shit when I was young. I got the money now. I yeah. can sell all these properties and get that cash, put it in some business in Portugal and be on my way. Right. Like yeah. I don't have to stay here. Yeah. I don't, yeah. Right here, so I don't see real estate as being like I don't have an emotional tie to it. I'm over it. Like yeah. I'm over that emotion. <laughs> I, li- I, I, I like the honesty, and then I like yeah. the the you could you could see like the passion and wanting a, a change and like the policies and stuff. So yeah, I, yeah, I appreciate that because for sure. Before I had this ego. My ego was <laughs> I want to own a bunch of properties. I want to tell people I got like 20 units. Now I'm like fuck that. You know yeah. how much work 20 units is? Yeah, you know, yeah. I can't deal with 20 people trying to shoot me. Like, I just, I don't want that. Right? So 20 like, old ladies trying to shoot 20, me. 20 <laughs> ladies who are out of the country trying to, like, ruin your life. Yeah. Like, I don't need that because I'm not protected from bad people. Yeah. And that level of stress, I don't need it. Yeah. I, this is why so many people don't really do real estate. They put their money in other assets. It's Real estate is a great place to be on the come up. But mm-hmm. once you're up, you don't really need it anymore, especially yeah. if the country's going to shit. Like you want to actually get out of it so you can take that money and put it somewhere else. Do real estate somewhere else where you have protection, where the government is more supportive. Yeah. Right? So I don't know. We'll see. But I'm I'm certainly not playing for volume anymore. I'm playing for simplicity, for ease. Quality of life. Quality of life, margin. Now yeah. I'm going for margin. I'm not going for volume anymore. Before it's like, number of units now it's percentage of return you know yeah. and if that means two properties yields me you know over six figures i'll take the two over the 10 that i'm losing money on for sure you for know? sure yeah so I, I agree is, is uh getting out slowly but surely and only investing in things that make a ridiculous return that makes sense to justify the labor yeah into it yeah, well said. Well said. Thank you, Don Don. Um, go ahead and drop your information so everyone knows where to follow you. Yeah, the best way is just go to my website, dondonzu.com, D A N D A N Z H U.com. It has all of my links, it has all my YouTube stuff, whatever. I don't really do enough, but I will in the future. I'll be releasing courses soon, you know, all of that. But for now, the best way is just to follow me on that website. I'm publishing my first book this year on recruitment. So that's like what we talked about earlier. That's a very niche subject matter. If you're interested in that, add me, send me a note. I'm, I'm actually compiling people for my launch team right now for the book. Um, so happy to continue producing content, having conversations like this and just sharing the little that I know about the random stuff that I've done. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. I like that. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I hope you have a great day. And you guys heard it here. This is the Misguided Podcast where we intend to guide you to a better future. My name's Juwan. I'm sitting here with Don Don. Make sure you guys tap in and follow her. Okay, we'll see you on the other side. All right, let's...